Welcome everybody to our adventure today. We are so excited to offer this adventure series, which is geared for young people, but engaging for all ages. I'm Katherine Hernan Powell. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Appalachian Trail Conservancy here in our regional office in Roanoke, Virginia. Um, and I'm here with my amazing colleagues on the line, um, Alyssa and Julie, and I believe Chloe and Delia are joining us later. Um, and we have pivoted our regular education workshops for teachers and taken a virtual hike up the trail this year, since everybody, of course, is pivoting to the virtual space in education these days. Um, so we started out in Georgia with the Science and Habitats of Rattlesnakes, and we have been heading north every two weeks uh, up towards Maine to explore a different subject connected with the trail in every state with uh, local educators and partners looking at flora and fauna and history and culture and all kinds of great topics. So this week's adventure brings us to New Hampshire uh, and we are gonna be learning about climate change in the White Mountains with Patty Dugan Henriksen and Rachel Fryerman. These sessions are a resource for educators, for students, for parents and guardians and for anyone who's interested in learning more about these topics. So please do check out the ones you may have missed on our YouTube channel which can be found on ATC's website, AppalachianTrail.org, uh, if you look for the adventure page. Um, a little bit about the Appalachian Trail. So many of you may know about the Appalachian Trail. It's a unit of our national park system and a hiking trail that goes through 14 states from Georgia to Maine. It's built by volunteers and is taken care of by over 6,000 volunteers still today. Our organization, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, is a nonprofit that works with hundreds of partners like the National Park Service and National Forest Service and all the volunteers to make sure it's an experience that everyone can enjoy and learn from. So we are so excited to have speakers through this adventure series tell us more about the different aspects of the trail from hiking, history, and recreation, the plants and animals, and the powerful healing that can come from walking. Uh, so now let me go ahead and introduce our amazing instructors today. Patty Dugan Henriksen is a um, formal and non-formal educator. She's been doing it for over 35 years. She currently teaches middle school science in Groveton, New Hampshire. She's passionate about involving her students in partnerships and citizen science projects, such as working with the Appalachian Mountain Club on climate change, raising trout and warm water species through New Hampshire's Fish and Games Watershed Ecology Program, investigating extreme weather with the Mount Washington Observatory's WeatherX, and studying milkweed genetics through St. Olaf College's Got Milkweed Project. Uh, Patty previously worked as a visitor in information specialist with the USDA Forest Service on the Androscoggin Ranger District of the White Mountain National Forest near the base of Mount Washington. And she and her family love to spend time together hiking the mini trails near their home in Lancaster, New Hampshire. Rachel Fryerman works for the Appalachian Mountain Club where she manages their youth programming, including the A Mountain Classroom Program for Schools. During her childhood, Rachel often traveled from her home in Cambridge, Massachusetts to the mountains and woods of New Hampshire and Maine. On those hiking and skiing trails, she fell in love with the outdoors and developed a belief in the power of outdoor and environmental education to support youth development and an understanding of one's place in an ecosystem and community. Today, Rachel works with AMC's education staff and teachers across New England to provide outdoor place-based learning opportunities that are inclusive, equitable, and relevant to students of all backgrounds. When not working, Rachel can be found with her wife and two young children on their farm in Bartlett, New Hampshire, or romping around the woods of the White Mountains, including on the Appalachian Trail. So thanks so much uh, for bearing with me through that introduction. And now I'm excited to pass the baton over to Rachel. Thank you so much. I'm gonna share these slides here. Thank you all so much for, for being here today. We're really excited to be given this opportunity and excited to talk with y'all. So we'll start off with just where are we? Uh, as, as this trip has been traveling north, we're now in Northern New Hampshire and we wanna take a moment and acknowledge where we are in the traditional lands that we are living and working on. So uh, we are that little yellow star. I'm currently in Pinkham Notch, right? See the Appalachian Trail out my window, uh, right at the base of Mount Washington. And this is the traditional land of the Wabanaki Confederate and more specifically, spe specifically of the Abenaki people. Uh, the dark green area that you can see on this map is the White Mountain National Forest. And so that'll be the region that we're, we're talking specifically about today. And our guiding question for today is going to be, how does climate shape ecosystems? And what happens when it changes, when climate changes? 
So to start off, it's helpful to, to know a bit about what, what climate is. And uh, oftentimes we think of climate as being associated with weather, but they are in fact a little bit different. So when we think about the differences between climate and weather, weather is the conditions of the atmosphere at any given time. So when I look outside my window right now, it's a beautiful blue sunny day here in Northern New Hampshire. It's a little bit windy out, um, but it's, it's a quite a pleasant day today, which is lovely. Uh, but when we think about climate, we're, we're thinking more broadly about the average conditions in the atmosphere over a really long period of time. And generally for scientists and climatologists, we're thinking of at least 30 years for that scope of, of time. If that's a little bit tricky to remember those big definitions, I like to break it down a little bit simpler. And uh, when I think about weather, I think about what clothes am I wearing today? So, you know, being winter here in New Hampshire and cold and windy, I put on a big, a big coat and a hat and some gloves to go outside. And when we think about climate, we're thinking about what clothes do I have in my closet? So even though it's winter out right now, I also have a bathing suit and shorts and uh, those things that I need for the climate here in New Hampshire. And we can look at folks who are, are living in much warmer places, they might not have that same winter apparel because the, the climate is different there. So again, weather, what am I wearing today? What am I putting on to leave my home? And climate is what clothes do I have in my closet? That's an, an easier way to, to think about it. So we're gonna play, play a little game, get y'all involved. And we're gonna put some pictures up in just a moment. And Catherine's going to share a poll. And for each picture, we want you to choose whether you think the picture is, is depicting climate or weather. Now, certainly we could look at, at any picture and probably find aspects of both being shown, uh, but choose which one you feel like it is more depicting or depicting better. All right, so this is our first picture. Is this picture better depicting climate or weather? What do you think? And if you want to put in a little bit about why, feel free. We've got Matthew says climate, Carol says climate, uh, Kim says climate, Elaine says climate, Alyssa says everybody on Facebook is saying climate. Awesome, excellent. Yeah, so when we when I look at this picture, right, I see these yellow trees, the deciduous trees that have, uh, their leaves are changing and certainly this landscape would look a lot different if we didn't have those colder temperatures, shorter days that are, are coming in here. All right, we're gonna jump into the next one. What do you think about this one? Weather or climate? And you can put it right into the chat. Matthew says weather, Kristen says weather fog question mark Kim says weather Elaine says weather yeah awesome I I agree with these sentiments right this is a nice blue sunny day um this person's out out for a nice hike but we're really focused on kind of the big sky here showing a weather event how about this this one this is taken uh over by Lonesome Lake Hut in near Franconia Notch, in Franconia Notch, so the AT passes nearby, not quite right past the hut. All right, we got more votes for weather. More so votes for oh, weather. Oh, wait, Matthew says climate. Oh, Matthew, the outlier. Yeah, so this is one, you know, could could be either. I think, I think we could probably make a great argument for both, right? This is a, a pretty, maybe a windy, snowy day that we're seeing here. And also when we look at this tree and when we look at this landscape, we can see that the, the ways in which uh, this is shaped by perpetual snowfall, by uh, a, lot of, a lot of harsh conditions, right? If we look at this little tree and to the left of the big tree here, that's missing a lot of its branches up top. That to me is a sign that there's a lot of wind that's coming through this area. And uh, this is a tough place to grow. So I think Again, lots of options for both. All right, last one here, weather or climate. This is not a picture from Northern New Hampshire. I'll tell you that much. We got one vote for weather from Kim. Oh, and, and one from Kristen also for weather. Elaine says it could be either. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. So we see a picture that, you know, maybe this is a, a hurricane moving into a somewhat tropical area. It's at least really high winds. So definitely there's some sort of weather event happening here. 
And when we look at the type of vegetation that's growing here, we can again see the ways in which in which climate is, is impacting this ecosystem. And we're gonna come back to that in just a moment. So thank you all, thank you all for chiming in. It's not gonna be the last time, so keep your keyboards accessible. Uh, so when we think about the climate here in the White Mountains, it's really defined by these four distinct seasons. So of course we have summer, fall, winter, and spring. Uh, really cold, frigid winters, pretty hot summers. We have a, a pretty extreme temperature range here down in the valleys we're looking at it could be negative teens during during the nighttime uh, with decent frequency at least a few times every winter and then in the summertime it's it can get well above 100. So a really big temperature range. Uh, we also have lots of precipitation here so heavy snowfall lots of rain we see big weather events like blizzards and nor'easters and hurricanes passing through and we have pretty high humidity relative to, to other regions in the country. So we want to hear from you. Tell us a little bit in the chat. How would you describe the climate where you live, where you're zooming in from today? What's the climate like? You can think about things such as the precipitation that you get, or what is the temperature like? Do you have four seasons like we do up here, or is it a, you know, it doesn't look different than that. Me, would you like me to read them out to you, Rachel? Yeah, that'd be great. I still, they're still not coming up for me. I can't get it to open. Got it. Um, we've got some Matthews in South Central Pennsylvania where it's warm and lots of precipitation. Uh, I said I've got four seasons here in Roanoke, Virginia, but we're lucky if we get more than a few days of snow in the winter, hot and humid summers. Uh, Kim has six degrees in Columbus, Ohio today. Cold, icy, eight feet of snow. Wow. Whoa. That's awesome. <laughs> Excellent. Elaine says she's got four seasons, temperature extremes between summer and winter, most years plenty of precipitation. Oh, Kim says eight inches, not feet. That would have been oh, all shut. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I like heard about all these big snow. I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, awesome. And thanks. actually, Catherine, I have it yeah. now. I can see okay. it. It works, works in magic. Yeah, so I see four seasons and lots of snow. More snow from Connie on Facebook. Awesome. So yeah, we see a lot of variability, even just in the you know the areas that the Appalachian Trail covers, where y'all are calling in or zooming in from today. Uh, there is a there's a lot of variation. So why why does this matter? And when we think about climate, we can think about its impacts. And one of the things that climate is really really heavily impacting is the ecosystems of a region. Um, it is one of, climate is one of the main determinants of what an ecosystem looks like, right? We can think about a desert, for instance, how the climate there will absolutely shape what the ecosystem is, right? If there's very little precipitation, that's gonna impact what types of plants are gonna grow there and consequently what types of animals will live there as well. And it's the same, tr same is true for up here in Northern New Hampshire, up in the White Mountains. So when we think about our ecosystems here in the Whites, and for those who have been here, you might be thinking of some pictures in your mind of what these mountains look like. Our ecosystems are really defined by these three distinct forest zones. And so the lowest forest zone that we have up here is the Northern Hardwood Zone. And when we're talking about this, we're thinking about elevation that is below 3000 feet. Um, we have a lot of deciduous trees that are there, so beech and birch and maple. We can see some beautiful foliage in the back of this picture here. As a result, we have a lot of very large mammals that will live in this zone. So we might see moose, we might see black bear. Uh, we have you know, a, a big diversity in what can live there. And we see that the, the leaves are changing color in the fall. As we move up the mountain, we move into the boreal zone. So this is thinking about 3,000 to 4,000 feet of elevation. And here we see the trees really start to shift. So we see a shift from deciduous trees that we saw lower down to more of those evergreen trees, the spruce, the fir. There are still some paper birch, right? Kind of on that lower, the lower edge of that. We start to see a lot more moss and lichens and fir and the, or ferns, excuse me, and the organisms that, the animals that are living there are a little bit smaller. So we might find some pine marten, we might find uh, certainly a lot of different bird species, maybe a snowshoe hare, uh, there's a, you know, but we're not seeing 
as many moose or bear that are, that are living in that area and certainly impacted by what food is available. And as we're going up the mountain, we can think about how the climate is changing. So as we go up the mountain, we are starting, it's starting to get a bit colder and it's starting to get a bit wetter and also windier. So when we get up to the top of the mountain where those conditions are, are really starting to be a bit extreme, that cold, that wind, that moisture, uh, we enter the alpine zone. And here in New Hampshire, our alpine zone is substantially lower than it is if we're out in the Rockies or in other mountainous areas. So we're really looking about 4,400 feet and up is our, our alpine zone. Here in the White Mountains, we have eight square miles of alpine zone, which is the largest alpine area east of the Rockies. And this is made up of a lot of small shrubby plants and grasses. We find things uh, like the Krumholtz, these little stunted trees that are, even though they're really short, they're really old. We find plants like diapensia that grows really low down to the ground. These plants are growing really slowly. It's a really hard place to grow. We, again, we see lots of moisture, heavy winds, um, and, and really cold, cold temperatures. And we can look at a kind of an example of that here when we think about Mount Washington. So Mount Washington, you're familiar with the Appalachian Trail. It's one of the higher peaks on the trail, not the highest, but one of them, and the, the tallest peak north of Virginia. And on the summit of Mount Washington, there's actually a weather observatory, which is pretty special and certainly really valuable as we think about data collection um, for this extreme area. They like to say that they are home of the world's worst weather. Uh, but this observatory was built up there in 1932 and it's staffed 365 days a year. So there's folks up there living up there collecting weather data. And when we think about the climate up on Mount Washington, just to give y'all a sense of what that alpine zone is looking at, looking like, we see an average temperature over the course of a year of uh, just about 27 degrees Fahrenheit. We're looking at close to 100 inches of precipitation. That's the water equivalent. So if we took snow and turned it into water, how much precipitation there would be. Over 280 inches on average of snow and ice accumulation and an average wind speed of 35 miles an hour. So this is a picture of me up there with a group of students. We're flying a kite in some high winds. Uh, but it's a tough place, tough place to live, right? And you can imagine trying to be a plant or an animal up in this alpine zone with these are the average conditions over the course of the year. Um, and a fun, a fun fact about Mount Washington and this observatory. So they opened it in 1934 and 32, excuse me. And then in April 1934, they recorded at what was at the time the highest wind speed record um, or set the highest wind speed record of 231 miles per hour. And uh, it still, still stands as the highest that was recorded by a, by a human and an instrument. So there, it's been broken elsewhere, but uh, that human recorded piece is, is important. And so we can think about the ways that climate impacts ecosystems. We can also think about the ways that climate impacts our life. And for us as humans interacting with an area, it has really big impacts as well. These two pictures on the left are a bit of a historical lens to this region of the White Mountains. So the top picture is from the times when logging was a really predominant industry here right around the end of the 1800s, early 1900s. This national forest, what is now the national forest, was actually really extensively logged. 96% uh, of the forest or what is now the forest was logged. And that was that was possible and motivated by the fact that climate had enabled these really large tree species to grow here and really valuable resources when we look to the cities and the development that was happening elsewhere. So a lot of extensive logging um, that logging later led to, <coughs> excuse me, to the development of the Weeks Act, which led to national forests and, and greater protection. So as we think about a conservation lens, certainly there were impacts there and we could go down a whole path about that. Um, but it also in, has impacted the recreation and why people are coming to this region. So that picture just below the train is a picture of Tuckerman Ravine, which is on the east side of Mount Washington, which is a really iconic backcountry ski destination. Um, it's actually named after a botanist, but so there's some, some great vegetation that's growing there as well. But in the wintertime and the spring, skiers from all over for almost 100 years now have, have flocked to that region. And um, it's a you know, it's a big place to ski and has created quite a ski culture here in this region. On the right side of this slide, we see two more current day pictures. And so we certainly 
uh, the agriculture of an area and what folks are growing and eating, as well as what the animals are eating is very heavily impacted by climate. Uh, so here we've got some, some alpine blueberries that are growing, that grow extensively through the mountains here in the summertime. And then the recreation industry is absolutely impacted. So we've got some, some kayakers here. I mentioned skiing before, the hiking, all of these things would not look the way they do without the climate impacting them, without the climate kind of shaping these sports. And we can think about the ways that these recreation opportunities then connect to people's jobs, to folks coming here. We have a pretty heavy reliance in this region on tourism and particularly recreational tourism. So folks are coming to, to ski, to hike, to go snowmobiling, uh, to go cross country skiing, all of, these, all of these activities that get folks outside and are very connect, connected to what the climate looks like. So I want everyone to take a moment in the chat and I'd love for y'all to share how does climate impact the lifestyle where you live? Does, how does it impact what you might do for fun? Is there something that you like to, to do or, or maybe your work that is connected to the climate in some way? Oh, I see the, the comment about the cool kite, thank you. <laughs> it was one of my favorite teaching tools is a kite. So you're in the chat, what are some ways in which climate is impacting the way in which you live where, where you do? We've got hiking turns into snowshoeing, absolutely. And you can think about jobs that folks are doing in your region. You can think about what you do outside. Mm, backpacking with limited water resources, absolutely. So there might be safety things that you need to consider due to the climate, certainly. Sometimes we're thinking about insects that might be present because of the climate. A narrower sugaring season. Yes, we have seen the sugaring season up here change a lot. Love to ski. It's really variable. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, so we're seeing, we're starting to see comments about, you know, how some of these things might be changing. Very hot human, human summer, right? So it might impact when you want to go hiking. The ticks and the deer flies might impact what we're doing. Invasive species. Excellent. Awesome. So we can, we can certainly see the, the importance of climate, right? The ways, the many ways in which it impacts the world around us, both the, the beyond human world, the natural world, as well as what we as, as humans are doing. And because it is so impactful, there's a lot of research that is being done both worldwide as well as locally here in the White Mountains. Um, so we have here at the Appalachian Mountain Club, we have staff and volunteer scientists who are collecting data and doing research as it pertains to climate. And then I mentioned before the, the weather observers at the Mount Washington Observatory. I saw in the chat um, a comment about this cat. So the, I'll just give, give the cat a shout. This is Marty who, who was the observatory cat who unfortunately just passed away this winter but had lived up there for, for many years. Um, and was the, the signature cat in the observatory. So I, I don't know if, if they're getting a new cat, but uh, TBD on that front. But he lived up at the top of Mount Washington. Um, so we can, see, we can see the importance, we can see that all of this data is, is being collected. And I'm gonna, from here, I'm gonna pass it over to Patty, who's gonna talk a little bit about what this research is finding both globally as well as locally. Okay, thanks, Rachel. And just an update on the cat. Um, because my students were asking about that as well. And when we asked some of the weather observers on the summit, they said, yes, they are in fact going to get a new cat. They're going to get it from a local animal shelter in North Conway, and they are waiting until spring, but they are actively looking for another cat right now. So that, that made my students feel much better because they were very sad when the cat passed away. I teach middle school science in Groveton, New Hampshire. We're a very small school. We have 208 students in grades six through 12, and 79 of those are middle school students. We've worked over a number of years with the Appalachian Mountain Club, and we have a lot of support from our administration, both the building principal and the superintendent, which allows us to do this. And, and that's really key in our being able to work with different partners. Um, the other thing that's really key is because we're a small school, 
that we can work in small groups and actually make things happen. We've been working with the AMC on their climate change program for three years now. And one of the first activities we do with the students in a normal year is we spend an overnight at either Pinkham Notch or Crawford Notch. This year, we didn't get to do that. Um, so we dove right into the activities. And the first one is getting students to look at graphs. As Rachel said, there's a lot of research that goes on. A lot of that research is in data tables that make your head spin. The summit takes weather um, readings every hour around the clock. And there are many, many years of it. So it's, it's a lot of data. Um, so it's presented often as a graph. And if you look at the graph, this one is showing atmospheric carbon dioxide. And the first thing we do is, because many of my students, again, and, and lots of students, aren't really used to interpreting graphs. Their eyes kind of glaze over and they just move on to the next thing. But we ask them to look at the graph. I'm gonna ask you to look at the graph now and read what you see. And just what do you notice about it? What story is it telling? You don't have to be scientific or an analyze it. Just, just looking at this with no other knowledge, type in the chat something you see on this graph. Okay, it says the line is going straight up recently. Okay, spike. Um, we've broken a cyclical pattern. Okay, if you look before the 1950s, it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. Okay. I'll give people another couple of seconds if you want to add something. But yeah, this is something that we've noticed. If you look back, it says the number of years before today, okay? And year zero, which is on the right-hand side, is 1950. And this is going back 400,000 years and using fossil records and different types of ways of looking at carbon dioxide. Um, and it's never been above 300 um, parts per million. And if you look more recently, it's gone up and has a real spike. Okay, a sharp increase from Facebook, absolutely. Okay, and I, Kristen, I'd be happy to talk to you with your school in Wyndham because we, we've got a lot of cool stuff going on and I love talking about what we do. So yeah, we can I get emails later. Okay, so Rachel, if you wanna move to the next graph. So keep in mind that the atmospheric carbon dioxide has increased sharply. Okay, this one is Earth's surface temperature. And so it's saying variations of the Earth's surface temperature, and it's showing um, three different things. What do you notice about this one? Again, just what do you see? Anything anybody notices about this graph? Temperatures going up? Anything else? Okay. Facebook, the same patterns as the last graph. Keep that in mind. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Okay. A sharp spike, low temperature for about 500 years. Okay. And if you want to add anything else, feel free to add it. But again, we're looking at this. We're looking at the temperature over the past, from the year 1000 up until um, pretty much current day, okay, 1990 averages. And it says it correlates directly with the atmospheric carbon. Okay, you guys again are adults, so you're remembering this more quickly. Students, it takes a little longer to figure that out. But if we look at the year by year data from tree rings and other sources, we can see again that the variation was pretty low, it was, okay, the 50 year averages. And then when we look at the thermometers, more recently there is a spike in the temperature. Okay, and Facebook says it was a slow decline then spiked. So we're seeing some natural patterns and now we're trying to figure out why might there be a spike? But again, with the students, we're still just talking about what do you see, what do you notice? Okay, Rachel? 
And here's Mount Washington's annual temperature. Okay, Rachel talked about the winds on Mount Washington and they also um, have interesting temperatures. And year round, it really varies and can be quite chilly or can get warm. Um, but if you look at the overall pattern, what are you noticing about the overall pattern of the annual temperature? It's going up. Again, we have it going up. Okay. It's like being in the car with the windows rolled up. That's a great comparison. Okay. And we're seeing it. And again, if you want to keep adding, that's for, fine. But again, we're seeing from 1935 up until the present, there's a gradual increase. And if you look at the temperatures, okay, the 1935, the average, sorry, the annual temperature is about 26.5. It's gone up to about 28. And that may not seem very big in terms of a difference, but it is a trend where it's going up. It says, Gabby stopped below 27 since 96 hasn't. Okay. So again, just take a look at the graph. And we're just at this point, like I said, I'm getting kids used to looking at the graphs. What do they see? What do they notice? And then Rachel, can you go on to the next slide, please? And now we have Pinkham Notch down where Rachel is at the base of Mount Washington. And again, you're seeing a very similar trend that it's a little bit warmer than on the summit, but again, the temperatures are continuing to rise and there is variation, but the overall trend is that the temperature is rising. Okay. And we can go on to the next one. And so it says, what did you notice? Some things that you should have noticed and you did, you talked about this, that there's an increase in carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. There are similar increases in Earth's surface temperature and the average temperature, the annual temperature is increasing both on the summit and at Pinkham Notch. So we're seeing a correlation as you pointed out between carbon dioxide and temperature we're seeing as one increases, so does the other. And we're seeing a constant increase. Okay, and the next one, please. And this is just a quick explanation of how carbon dioxide is trapped into the atmosphere. And we're looking at the sunlight coming in and being warming the Earth's surface and then being reflected back to space. But some of it is trapped and more and more of it is being trapped. So there's more energy absorbed by the atmosphere and there's more energy that is causing those temperatures to rise and continue to rise. Okay, and, and we talk a little bit more about greenhouse gases, but we just introduce it at first with the graphs. Okay, the next one. So here's something that I, I find really interesting and disturbing. Okay, it talks about the rate of change so not what are the actual temperatures, but how fast is the temperature changing? And if you look at the four seasons and look at Pinkham Notch at the base and Mount Washington at the summit, you can see that some of the seasons aren't changing that much in terms of temperature, particularly on the summit. You can see that there is a more dramatic change um, at the base between seasons. So again, our, our seasons are changing and the temperatures are changing in our seasons, okay? Um, another one, and this has a direct impact on what Rachel was talking about and some of you mentioned liking skiing, the snowpack is changing. And if you look, it says, is the day of the first snowfall changing on Mount Washington? Is the day of the last snowfall changing on Mount Washington? And, and you can just take a minute and look at the, the data here, okay? And so we have earlier and later of the first days of snowfall and the last days of snowfall. And you can see that they are in fact changing just like the temperature, okay? Just like the other conditions that we've been talking about. Go ahead, Rachel. And that's affecting a lot of the plants in the ecosystem 
Okay, the blue bead, bleed, uh, blue bead lily or Clintonia is a plant that you find at the lower elevations. It's very common. Um, and you can see that it's not a huge decrease, but it is flowering earlier and earlier each year. Okay, there's a trend that it's flowering earlier. And if you look at alpine plants, like the next one is diapensia. Okay, this is one of the alpine plants. And if you look at the flowering time for that, um, again, it is on the decrease. And if you look from, it's, this is from 1934 to 2014. Okay, so it was June 12th down and de decreasing little by little. And again, it doesn't seem like a huge change, but it is a significant change because of the trend that it just continues to decrease. We can go on. So what can we do? So climate change is not just happening in the White Mountains. Climate change is happening pretty much everywhere. Okay. And so there's a lot of different things that we can do. And if you can go on the next slide, let's think about, um, and you can do some research to find this out. But also, if you know any of these, maybe just pop some comments into the chat. But is climate change, how is it or is it impacting your community? Have you noticed a difference in temperatures? You know, is it just anecdotal evidence that people say when I was a kid, okay? Are there more extreme weather events? Okay, certainly if you look at West Texas right now, it's pretty extreme there, okay? Talk to people in your community, are they being impacted? Okay, so if anybody has any comments on how the climate is impacting and climate change is impacting them, go ahead and drop them in. So are any of these plants dependent on migratory pollinators? And that's a really important, not just migratory pollinators, but pollinators in general. Um, because as the plants are flowering earlier and the pollinators, if they're, especially if they're migratory, are arriving later or they're hatching later, there's a disconnect between the pollinators and the plants. So it absolutely is something that's being looked at. Okay, there's more hurricanes. They seem to be more often and stronger, absolutely. Any other comments? Is there another question? It says that's the pollinators, that was twice, okay. And it says warmer temperatures during winter months so maybe not as much snow, maybe effect, affecting tourism in the ski industry, maybe infecting the ecosystems. And this is another um, activity that my students really like. It's a real eye opener for them. And it's one way they can take action um, very easily. And also um, it's very easy to take the action with it and tells them something about their lifestyles. The back of the sheet has different questions on it and the different colors represent different things they do in their lifestyle, okay? So the one that always amazes me is the red because the red asks one of the questions is how many vehicles does your family own? And we have three drivers in my family, we have two cars. Um, several of the students have 10 or 12 or more vehicles because they have cars and they have pickup trucks and they have snow machines and they have ATVs. And, and so the red tends to be a very large area. It also asks under blue things like, do you live in a house? Then color two circles. Do you live in an apartment? Color one. So it's, it's showing them visually what their impact is based on their carbon footprint. And then we can talk about what are things that you're willing to change? What are things that you must have? And, and we talk about choices and how they have the choice. Um, sometimes they do, sometimes their parents make the choice for them, but what are they going to choose to take action on and what are they going to accept? There's some other um, things that people can do. You can get involved in your local community. You can let other people, whether it's your students or your community know what you know. And there's also a lot of initiatives out there right now one that um, I really like is the NEF, National Environmental Education Foundation Climate Superstars Challenge. This happens for 10 days every October and NEF in conjunction um, with other organizations releases 
10 energy activities. And they're very short, they're five or 10 minute ones, but it's just, again, making students aware of their lifestyles and what's happening. One of the activities was to um, count how many light bulbs are in your house. And so the students started out by counting how many light bulbs are in their ceiling or in their lamps. And then someone said, but what about the microwave? And what about the oven? And what about the dryer? And they, they kept finding more and more light bulbs that they didn't really think about before. It also talks about vampire energy. You know, what do you leave plugged in that is using energy, but you're not using? Are you leaving your chargers plugged in when you aren't using them? So again, it gives them information about what they're doing and then they can think about making some choices. And we have, do leaf blowers contribute to our carbon footprint? I don't know. Cause I, I don't know, it, it, it could go both ways. I would think you're using energy for the leaf blower, but then you're also blowing the leaves and composting them so they're breaking down. So that might be a shared one. It's hard to, hard to know. It's a good question, it's something to think about. It says all states need to do smog checks as a something yearly test on vehicles. Okay, so that's, there's a lot of uh, ways people can join. Okay, Rachel. And they can learn from other youth and what they're doing. There are students and youth from all over the world that are leading the movement in terms of climate change. And this just lists some of the groups and some of the people who are involved that are doing amazing work. So that, that's something they can learn what other people are doing and are any of those things possible or interesting for them to do. And finally, okay, here's a quote from Earthrise by Amanda Gorman. And it says, so I tell you this not to scare you, but to prepare you, to dare you to dream a different reality. And I, I think that's a really great thing to keep in mind um, as we move forward and as we look at what's happening with the climate today and into the future. So with that, we're gonna open it up to questions and Rachel and I will try to answer them for you. And you can type them in the chat or in Facebook, you can put them in the comments. Sure, I can, I can speak to uh, the, the second question as far as outdoor activities centered on climate change. Uh, so we do here at the AMC, we do school programming with, with school groups that are like Patty's that are climate change focused. We are currently doing those uh, virtually. So if you have a school that is cannot travel right now, uh, we're happy to, happy to support climate change education virtually. But typically we do host uh, overnight residential programming as well as day programming at AMC facilities to do climate change education. We also run some summer courses for teenagers that uh, often will include a climate change education component. So we're, we're building those in. As far as the, the extreme temperatures and winds on Mount Washington, Patty, do you wanna to speak to that with your programming with the OBS? Yeah, so we can, we can talk about that. And um, so they've been keeping the weather records since 1935 and the weather is extreme up there. What my students have been looking at is six different weather factors and then looking at climate over a longer period of time. They've been looking at temperature, they've been looking at wind, they've been looking at precipitation, humidity, cloud cover and air pressure. And what they've talked about and come to a consensus of is that if weather is extreme, at least three of those qualities have to be really different from the normal. Um, and, and a good example is this week we had a weather event on Monday into Tuesday and the students decided it was not extreme because even though there was ice and there wasn't any school, we had a remote day because of that, um, the weather really wasn't that extreme. The temperatures weren't that unusual. The wind wasn't, the, you know, the other factors weren't that extreme. So, and the other thing they talked about, and, and I'm kind of going around this a little bit, but they talked about extreme depends on where you are. That we looked at again, West Texas, where it's been six degrees and six degrees in West Texas is very unusual compared to here. 
and they've got snow and it, you know, looking at the pictures, it doesn't look like that much snow, but we talked about how people don't own snow shovels or winter jackets. So extreme depends on where you're at. Um, I'm not sure if the weather on Mount Washington is more extreme. It seems to be from the factors we've been looking at that it continues to be extreme, but not a whole lot more than it has been in the past. It's, it's pretty consistently extreme. And there's a question as far as climate change mitigating policies and plans taking place in the White Mountains, um, whether at a federal, state, or local level. So yes, there's definitely, definitely some work that's being done. The AMC uh, does, the Appalachian Mountain Club does some policy and advocacy work in terms of climate change, thinking about um, energy use and the, uh, you know, for instance, the Northern Pass project was something that we were, we had some policy around. We're also looking at how we can conserve land and work with forestry in a sustainable manner. Um, so lots of different things happening there on a, you know, a local level. There are certainly initiatives around green energy and um, green technology. I would say that we would also lump uh, the education piece into local uh, efforts and certainly spreading, spreading the word and communicating with folks about what is climate change, what can we do is, is really a big piece of that. So additionally, the AMC has a couple um, community science projects that are taking place where they are working, where our, our staff scientists are working with community members to collect data. Uh, there's one that's happening this winter around snowpack so you can measure the depth of the snow where you are and help support that data collection initiative. We also do data collection on uh, flowering plants and speaking back to that question about the pollinators, uh, looking at when are these plants flowering and that's something that we, um, we do through iNaturalist. Yeah, one of the other things about climate change um, mitigating policies, th there's a very um, unusual relationship between federal, state, and local entities that they're all very involved. And one of the places that's doing a lot of research and climate research is Hubbard Brook Experimental Station. And that's part of the US Forest Service. And one of their huge projects, they were um, the place that was one of the first people to identify acid rain. And because of some of their mitigating factors, acid rain is not as prevalent. It's almost non-existent anymore. Although when they're studying it, they're also studying the summit and finding the plants at the summit were affected. And now one of the things that's kind of interesting is, okay, we've gotten factories to take care of the acid in their rain, but now we're finding there's less calcium in the soil and that's affecting plants. So yeah, there are, the Forest Service is definitely looking at climate change and what types of things have happened and they're affecting policy as well. And Hubbard Brook has a really neat project that they're doing this spring uh, where they are collecting uh, auditory data. They have sound recorders that are set up throughout their forest and they are set to turn on it in the beginning of April and run for a few hours in the morning and then I think an hour in the evening to collect data uh, on migratory birds. So data, this is kind of a new, a new thing for them, certainly, and this was influenced by COVID-19. So a neat, a neat thing to come out of the pandemic is this collection of, of sound data and uh, the ways in which that will be able to inform whether those migratory species are being impacted by a changing climate. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. That was so interesting. And we really appreciate you giving us your time. I see some round of, silent round of applause going on. <laughs> Uh, and thanks for everybody who joined us today. Hope you'll join us again as we travel to Maine.